Well, yeah, go ahead and ask me again what you need to ask. <laughs> yeah, just, just, to, just to kind of uh, su summarize uh, what I'd love to hear you talk about. So, so my, my claim is that the process of evolution is not guaranteed to uh, optimize for m most, if not all, of the things that we value. So, so happiness, mm -hmm. intelligence, uh, meaning, all of these things. Uh, and therefore, the condition in which we find ourselves, meaning the various limitations of our bodies, of our minds, uh, all, all these different features, I think are fundamentally up for improvement. And so as one, mm -hmm. as one uh, changes uh, the various aspects of the physiology, integrates uh, 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 the design devices, uh, changes the biology, we will change. And so at some point, what is a human and, and, and then your views on what is it that we should not change? What's the kind of essential? Yes. Hey, Richard. Yes. Hello. Sorry to keep you. Hi, Richard. Hi. Um, yeah. And happy Easter, by the way. Happy Easter. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, so uh, we've just started. I was just going to comment on something um, that Michael said. It's very important, I think, about um, the way we're evolving, what we're capable of doing, whether um, evolution takes any note of the things that we would actually value or not. And I think there are, there are several things really to to say about that. Um, one is to do with um, the model that we have of a human and what effect that has on us as well as on the research. Mm -hmm. and, and another is to do with the whole business of teleology direction, whether there is, I mean, you're, you're saying effectively that there is no direction to evolution and that's a, a, a very I think you're saying that anyway, but that's actually, a very common position. Well, just to say, actually, no, I, I'm not sure that's true at all. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying that if there is a direction, it, it and, and I, I'm, I think there are many okay. sort of smaller directions. I'm not just convinced that that direction is uh, aligned, as the current terminology is aligned with the things that we would like it to be aligned with. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I think the the biggest problem for us is uh, I've always found and increasingly found and have critiqued at length the the sole use of the model of the mechanism or machine in describing what a human being is and i think that at the same time that we believe although the, the belief may not be well founded that we're creating machines that are more like humans um, humans are indisputably being forced to be a little more like machines in order to interact all the time with what is increasingly um, a machine at the other end of the process, not another human being. So I think um, it has its impact for good or ill, and I think largely for ill. It can help us answer certain very small scale questions, because in a complex uh, system, you can always find small areas if you um, if you if you home in narrowly enough, you can find an area where a mechanism is actually quite a useful way of thinking, but it's not a good model of the the organism as a whole. So um, this also entails that when we think about human beings, we think of them largely in terms of a certain kind of cognition that we liken to something a computer might be able to do. But pretty much everything that matters in our lives is not at all like this. Um, when you listen to an astounding piece of music, when your daughter gets married, when you simply um, turn outwards to the beauty of nature, um, almost anything that we do that is not um, rigorously tied to some matter of expounding in words, we're, we're always um, bringing a whole host of things to bear that are, are the things that do give meaning to life. And, you know, there is a tendency to say there can't be meaning and there can't be values I'm not saying this is your position, but I'm just saying this is a position that one frequently counters. Um, and and my, my feeling is that there's a problem with it, because we decided in the late 17th century that we were going to pursue a kind of science in which ideas of any ideas of purpose, direction or value were ruled out at the base. And so it's a bit of a, um, a, a petitio principii to um, <laughs> spend a couple of hundred years examining um, the, the world and then say, 
we can't find any purpose or values in it because we rule them out at the start of the process. And I think being aware of that and the unspoken force that is so important of these things that we value, they might be, usefully can be, thought of in terms of the great platonic virtues of goodness, beauty, and truth, that these are not bad things to orientate your life by, and that I'm not sure that whatever it is we're doing at the moment is improving them. I also believe um, that there is enormous value in what looks very um, negative to our point of view, because the very idea of negation is to us something bad. But in fact, negation is how anything comes into being, by being uh, defined, sequestered from something else. And that, in fact, the business of not doing and not thinking, and indeed of silence, is absolutely critical to every important human endeavour. I'm absolutely convinced of this. And what we're doing is to drive out that space in which the other things can flourish. And machines don't help us with this. In many ways, they distract us. They substitute for that fruitful silence in which we can actually at last be creative and see deeply into the nature of things. They substitute something more familiar, more trivial. So I think those are some of the problems. And on teleology, which is another angle, um, whether we're going anywhere that sort of would, <laughs> um, would do us any good, I, I mean, I just have a simple observation, really, which is that you know, why is the life at all? Um, and why are why is it going in the direction that it seems to be going in terms of evolution? Uh, I think I said last time, and I'm, I'm not sure that both of you didn't agree, that, that consciousness may not be something that emanates from life, but is actually there in the cosmos. Uh, is a, is a, an ontological primitive. If that's the case, then what life brings is not actually consciousness, but what it seems to do is, is enormously increase responsiveness. And that responsiveness is to these, these values. I mean, I can't tell whether a lump of rock <laughs> um, is, is valuing things. I don't think it can value. Um, uh, creatures can value. And some creatures can value rather narrowly, and others value, I mean, a single cell can value certain things, but we can value more than any other creatures. And so something is happening in evolution that is at the cost of survival, because we are fragile, um, short-lived, uh, vulnerable creatures compared with many far, far, far longer lived ancestors. And I may have mentioned this, but you know, there are single examples of actinobacteria in the depths of the ocean that are themselves um, uh, uh, around a million years old. So uh, going through the redwood forest um, with their thousands and thousands of years and coming to the human being with this measly 70 years. And we are obviously not doing terribly well on surviving. I'm, I think that there's something that's driving this and I think it is responsiveness. I think it is that we are responsive to these deep things and response has in it this idea of responsibility and, and the sort of moral engagement with the world. And I know this is nothing like what, what I'm sure um, is normally talked about in, in, in the world in which either of you operate, but I do think it's important that just actually um, uh, creating texts, including from a computer that can spew out a text, is taking us further and further away from essentially creative, essentially connective, reverberative, um, resonant nature of human experience. So, sorry, I rather um, did a little spiel there, but I was trying to compress quite a lot into a short space. Oh. I'm totally with you, Ian. Are you? Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. What well, do you I mean, think, Mike? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm definitely in on the part where uh, I, I, I do think that uh, the things that we're interested in, including uh, consciousness and uh, mind and all that, uh, uh, predate life. I agree with that. I think it is a, I think it is a primitive. 
And I think what life is, as you said, what life is very good at is scaling it up. And I've tried to formalize this notion of a cognitive light cone, which literally is the spatiotemporal boundary of the biggest thing you can care about. So the biggest thing you can act the goals, right? So, so I've got this formalization of the, 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 the biggest goal that you as a cognitive system is, are capable of pursuing from little tiny local goals of bacteria and things like this to, you know, humans potentially having planetary and wider scale goals and things like this, including maybe uniquely the, the first ability to have goals that are bigger than your lifespan. Right. You know, if you're if you're a goldfish, your your all your goals are achievable because they're smaller than your expected lifespan. So it's it's fine. But if you're a human, many of your goals are fundamentally unachievable, perhaps. And so there could be various mm -hmm. psychological pressures there. But um, you know, I'm 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 completely with you on all of that. Um I I think uh I think I think I see them the the machine thing a little bit differently because and, and I think goals are essential and I think that we we are essentially uh uh goal-driven observers and uh, with values and all of that um i just see i just see a real spectrum between uh you know if if we if we look down the evolutionary uh, tree and even and even just in our own in our own bodies uh one can start very sort of very slowly and gradually uh replacing various things and you know when we've got our our wheelchairs and our glasses and things like this which to a you know to a primitive natural human may look oh my god like what is this you know you're 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 engineered to the gills you know but obviously that's not the that's not the limit of course you know and you're brushing your teeth and you're you're doing all these things to extend you know your natural state which is which is quite different than 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 where we are now so um you know I, i'm i'm very interested in this in this question of to, to me to me I think it's inevitable that we make, we end up making be, be, because because we are physical be, be beings in in in, uh, in large part. We, it's inevitable that we are going to make some some machines that are other kinds of minds. I don't think they're like us at all. I you know I think I think just because we can talk to them doesn't mean that they're like us at all. I think that uh, the question of whether or not they're dangerous doesn't hinge on whether they're like us. I think they can be completely unlike us and also be very dangerous or not. Um, I, you know, I think, I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of focused on this diverse intelligence idea where, where there are many other types of minds. Some of them are very different than ours and there are pros and cons to, you know, sort of, uh, uh um, relating to them, but, but, uh, the, there are many different, uh, different types of entities out there. And you're not talking about living creatures here. You're talking about artificial, uh, in so-called intelligence networks of some the kind. Whole, the whole business, I, you know, there's, there's, I've, I've tried to literally draw out a space of like, we, there, there's a space of possible beings that you can make yet. Yeah, yes, there are AIs now that you wouldn't call living for many reasons, but we also have in our lab, we have hybrids, which are, you know, there's some neurons mm. and they're driving a little robot and they're, you know, and, and, and they really do care about what happens, but their body is now different. They're not driving this kind of body. They're driving something else. And that robot may not even be in three-dimensional space. It may be in physiological space. They may live in a completely different problem space. And partly, you, you know, there are parts of them that you would call living and parts that you would call not. Uh, as 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 you might with a with a crab shell or something, you know there are components that have mechanical properties that aren't actually alive, but the whole thing is sort of you would call that alive. So there's just you know the space of possible. I, I think these crisp categories used to be quite useful when the technology wasn't there to blur them, but now we're starting to see that the possibilities uh, are such that I, I'm I, I'm I'm not sure these these very um, binary categories can be maintained. You know in the space of possible beings i think we're going to be able to explore and maybe out there in the universe already you know so it, it's already been done but we, we are going to explore all kinds of hybrids and cyborgs and every possible you know combination that that has a novel body and mind and we're gonna have to figure out ways to so i'm very interested also in the ethics aspect of it how do you relate to them right because in the olden days it was pretty pretty easy you sort of come and you, and you knock on it and if you hear a metallic clangy sound, that tells you everything you need to know. It came out of a factory and it's pretty boring and you can do whatever you want to it and, and, and that's fine. And if you hear sort of a, 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 you know, a soft thud, then you say, mm, you better be nice to it because it's a naturally evolved creature. But that's not going to do for us in the, in the coming decades. That's just not going to work anymore. And uh, I don't think those categories were actually ever really any good, but now they're definitely not going to be usable. So we have to come up with new ways to relate to something that's not just 
based on what do you look like and uh, and, and and how you got here. You know, that's that's kind of not not just in the sense of what's what it's made out of, but also so the um but but also the the behavioral properties, right? So mm -hmm. so I was thinking. <laughs> I was looking at my towel rail the other day and thinking that's made out of metal and trying to imagine it as the vibrating atoms in the lattices connected with one another, resonating in lockstep in a way that keeps all their bonds tidy and trying to think of it as an active thing. And then I was thinking about a, a machine in the classical sense, which has a causal a causal uh, topology at a completely different scale. This part's pushing that part, that part's pushing this part. And machines, are classical machines, are generally built in such a way that the causal scale that you're interested in at the machine level is completely disconnected from the causal dynamics at the molecular level. I don't, I don't want what this part is made out of to matter to the machine. This, you know, I can make this this arm or this lever or this cog out of something that has to behave like an arm or a lever or a cog. And I don't care whether it's made out of, I shouldn't have to care whether it's made out of steel or iron or brass or whatever. And the thing that's, the thing that's um, different about organic systems is how well connected those different dynamical scales are that they are connected with all of the scales in between, that we have a causal scale at the, at the scale of the organism, where there are parts and systems interacting with one another, and this part pushes that part, and that part pushes the other part, creating homeostatic cycles at that level, which are causally, you, there's a causally self-contained story at that level that makes sense. But it's really close to the level below, where the level below shows through and interacts with it in a way that, well, if you if you push it a bit or you stress it a bit, it begins to do something different. It changes into a different, you know, uh, causal story at the higher level because because the parts are giving way, the parts are squirming, the parts are changing, and that in a in a truly organic system, a living system, filters down through all of the levels right down to the molecular components that we can change our gene expression by thinking about it, by deciding to, which is just insane, right? We can go from, from this causal level of something that's happening at the scale of our bodies to something that's happening at the atomic scale. Mm -hmm. And those causal okay. scales are connected with one another upwards and downwards. So usually when we interact with the machine, we are, uh, you know, we feel ethically safe in turning it off or taking it apart because when you look inside it's just some parts it's just this part pushing another part and those parts so once you get down to the there's a there's a you go down a couple of levels you take this apart you take that apart and then it's just material right it's just like there's no more stuff inside that now that's just a cog there's no point looking inside the cog you you, know, you until you go down to the atomic scale there's nothing inside the cog right there's no connection between that causal scale and all the others. And the, the thing that is a bit different about the AIs that are occurring now is that they have quite a bit of causal depth. And they are, you know, they're deep learning systems as there's the, the, a clue in the name. They have quite a bit of causal depth. There's quite a bit of squirm. squirm. There's quite a bit of parts inside parts inside parts and they are harmonized with higher level structures that that are meaningful to us you know they're using words that are meaningful to us they're using ideas that are meaningful to us they're using things that are meaningful to us that are that are in tune with us and synchronized with us but they are not connected all the way down they are they are not connected all the way down like we are and that i do i do think it makes them a bit more dangerous than other kinds of machines and other kinds of um diverse intelligences because it because it, i think the yeah no go on 
No, because we're likely to think that it's like us because it looks like us on the surface, basically. But I don't mean exactly. Surface, I think it's not that it, you know, that it has eyes and nose like us, but <laughs> no, no, know, I, I know what you mean. New layers of causal structure. They, oh, that's like me. Yeah. Yes, I think the danger. I mean, we we sort of often misconceive. It seems to me the nature of the danger that it's something that these creatures will do to us um, in a sort of willful way. But in fact. Um, I think they are dangerous simply because people will um, mistake themselves for these machines and the machines for themselves, because because their whole way of thinking about what we're doing, who we are, and so on, has become so narrow. Children are taught from a very early age that really we're machines. And in fact, in an amazing um, uh, Royal Institution lecture to children, um, the lecturer begins by saying, you know, it's wonderful, take a look at one another. And this is marvellous because you're all just complicated machines. Now, that, that seems like a harmless remark in the, in the sort of world in which we move. But packed into it is something longer than the Encyclopedia Britannica about how how we conceive of what life is, what we're doing here, and what our goal should be. Even the phrase goal directed, which I, I know um, uh, Mike was using and everybody does, is only a part of what we do. It's what the left hemisphere, which is designed to have a goal and go straight for it and get it, um, does. But I'd like to put it another way, that there are um, there are things to which we are attracted. It's not so much that we're sort of pushed towards a goal and we know the steps and we take them, but there are things that we can't entirely account for, but are powerfully attractant. And, and that therefore, something like a final cause is operating, some idea of what could be, which is really just a potential that we're we're sort of not able to specify exactly, but we know there's something there in that area, and we're drawn towards realizing it. That is a quite different idea from being a goal-directed being, um, and it complicates the idea of what a cause is, because you know, famously Aristotle had four kinds of causes, and two of them have been removed. One is the formal cause, and the other is the final cause, the the the, the thing towards which the whatever it was, was designed. And we've been left, you know, simply with the, the, the pushing and shoving kind of causation. Um, and that, that seems to me, yes, that's, that's what a machine is. But an organism, an organism, you need to understand the whole before you can understand the parts, and you need to understand the parts before you can understand the whole. Now, I know that's a paradox, but I believe that when you get close to the truth in these areas, the paradox is what you find. I mean, to, to be able to say what um, a spleen is, you first of all got to know what a, a mammal is that has a spleen, and, and then you can understand it. So we, we're going all the time backwards and forwards between the whole and its parts, whereas the kind of thinking that is mechanical goes in one direction from the bottom up. It says, we can do this, that has a knock-on on that and produces that. that. What I'm trying to say about that, that is there's nothing wrong with it, but it's just a kind of very, very limited way of thinking about what we're dealing with, which is useful for some purposes. And because it's so useful in making us powerful, that bit of us that just seeks power, more money, greed, whatever it is, <laughs> um, is, is, um, is gratified by this and can't let go of it. And that may turn out to be dangerous. Not as I say, because machines may turn against us. I mean, they might do, I suppose. Uh, but in a certain curious sense, they're already doing so, if I may say so. I have found my life, uh, let me make a homely um, aside. I found that my life has become vastly more difficult over the last four or five years. And one can say uh, COVID and when this country, one can say Brexit and so on. But talking to people of all ages, everyone is finding the same thing. And it's to do with the fact that more and more and more of everything we have to do in daily life has become automated. And I know that's a million miles away from the really exciting um, 
imaginative um, sort of uses of artificial intelligence that um, you know we're talking about. But the fact is that all our lives are being deteriorated in front of our eyes by this business that we no longer can get an intelligent answer from a person. Everything has been delegated to a machine and the machine can't understand the context. It can't understand any ramifications. It can't understand anything that's implicit. And that is actually having a tangible, depressing, exhausting effect on the entire population of the West. I think it's one of the things that is already playing into why we're sick. So let me just put that on the table. <laughs> Yeah, I completely agree again. Uh, Go ahead, Mike. Well, I, I, so so I, I I definitely agree again with the with the first part. So I think I think that that story of uh, uh, drilling down to the parts uh, which we can do and we can see all the little cogs and things that are inside of ourselves. I mean, literally little little cogs and things, uh, and say, well, look, uh, you know, you're nothing but a machine. I mean, I, I agree that that is a very pernicious story, and I think that th there are other such stories as you know with, with we've talked with Richard many times about this the standard you know dog eat dog view of evolution and 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 mm. free will you know the business around free will and all all of these mm. I think are, I think are very pernicious stories uh, for 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 the human uh, kind of experience. Uh, but I have kind of a weird, uh, I won't say solution, but, but I think, but I think the answer lies in sort of the opposite direction. So, so long-term, and I don't know, by the way, that we will make it out of this. I, I think we're in a local minimum. I think things are, are t t trending downwards in these cases, as, as you said, but I think, and, and, and if we make it out of it, I think the way to make it out is actually to go in the opposite direction and to really embrace this this diverse intelligence field. So so what I see in a lot of discussions about this is be, be, people will say these these things are just like us and therefore all this good stuff or they're 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 not at all like you know or they're they're just like us and all this bad stuff. I, I think we have to embrace the idea that we are not the measure of all things and that we, we have a tendency to look at everything. And, and as you say, it's extremely dangerous. Both of you have said this. I think it's very true. It is extremely dangerous to misunderstand your interaction partner in every interaction, in the good ones, in the bad, in, you know, in the adversarial ones. If you have a fundamental misunderstanding of what you are interacting with, you are not going to do well. That's just, but, but I think, but I think the answer to this is to really get comfortable. And I hope, uh, you know, the, 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 the people of the future, and I think kids are, are not bad at this uh, n n natively. Uh, we'll have this intuitive understanding that we can relate to many things and many of them are just not like us at all. And that's okay. And we don't need to assume that they must be like us because they speak like us. That used to be true. It used to be that the only thing that talks were things that kind of like you, but that's not going to be true in the future. Your tea kettle will have opinions about the, you know, how, how much caffeine you should have and things like this. And, and, and everything in your life will talk, but that doesn't mean that they are like us. And I think if we truly embrace the lessons of diverse intelligence, we will figure out that there are many minds and, and many of them fail in different ways than we do. And we do too. We confabulate and we, you know, make things up and whatever, fine. But they will have different failure modes and you just need to know, much like we have with our, uh, you know, various animals and things. Uh, and this will just just scale that up. So I think I think really, really biting down on this, on this idea that there will be things that... Uh, mimic aspects of our behavior but are just not like us at all i think in the end we will come to grips with that and you know and and then and then we will have more productive uh in interactions with 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 each other with them with with everything else i think i think this 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 ability to only look at things through our own which if you know of course it's natural um kind of through our own lens is is really hurting us here and it's and it's and it's going to and exactly as you said not because they're going to do anything to us because because we are too myopic to 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 realize that not everything is you know is exactly uh, is exactly like us I noticed a bit of a, um, what I would feel is a bit of a slippage in what you said, um, in that you were looking for examples of intelligences other than our own, and you mentioned that 
ghastly kettle that I shall put straight in the bin if it speaks to me even <laughs> once about my caffeine intake. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you, you, and so there's that. But, and then you did also mention, and you might not have wanted to conflate this in any way, but you mentioned animals. Mm. And, you know, one of the things I feel very strongly about, I'm not a um, terrifically um, a person to pick up the fashions of the moment, but one word that I do think um, has become commoner and is important is anthropocentric, that mm. our view that we are, I mean, we are very special, no doubt about it. And we have qualities and characteristics that other animals don't. But the idea that somehow there's any comparison between a machine's ability to have what I insist is not intelligence, which would require understanding, which would mean having feelings, appreciating history, context, and having a body, and knowing that you're going to die. Um, that that is not the same as a, a more, as we look at it, limited intelligence of an animal, which which comes out very rough on this, because if we prize particularly the kind of cognitive um, processing, uh, to use the jargon, that as it were a machine can do and think that's what's special about humans. Well, these animals can't do it to the same extent. But I'd like to say that there's an awful lot going on in the minds of animals. Um, and the more, I, I mean, you, you will know about this more than I do, Mike, but I mean, in researching over the last 30 years, um, the capacities for animals to understand things, to think, to make calculations, but also to, to feel things, to honor things, to have rituals, to, I mean, they are, they are truly intelligent beings in the way that I don't think that the machine, however suave it's, overview of Wikipedia is and, you know, suddenly coming up with, you know, 300 words on what is Ian McGilchrist really about in his latest book, um, which, which somebody showed me the other day. It wasn't a, wasn't a bad stab, but I mean, it's not intelligence. <laughs> so I just wanted to tr just try and preserve a distinction there, because I think it's important between different kinds of living intelligence. And I don't think that you can then do a segue and go, but these machines are just rather like that. I don't think they are rather like that. Would that be aligned with a sentiment that I have more in common with and there's more shared values and more, um, more appropriate compassion for a cockroach than I would for ChatGPT? Is that am I Yes. <laughs> Yes, there is. Um, I think that you know when you uh, when you stress a cockroach, that's the same kind of stress that I feel when I'm stressed. It's cockroach stress, not human stress. But there's well, something there's something shared and valued. There's there's some shared value there that there isn't between me and you. Yes, I think that's right. I mean that that's 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 giving it a hard test um, because cockroaches are not what most people warm to, as it were. <laughs> but but, I, but and we can never get inside them and know how stressed they are. But I believe that yes, this is a continuum with feelings that we have. Certainly, in in many animals, there are. I think we ought to be awfully careful about what we what we assume about animals, what we do with animals, because we do have a, a responsibility again. That word that brings something about a relationship that is a two-way relationship. Um, but the, yeah, there's, there is, so there's something about the cockroach or the other living thing that might be uh, limited in its cognitive like cone compared to me, but it's- Enormously. Still, it, but, uh, <laughs> well, thank you. Um, <laughs> but um, but uh, built to the same stuff, and by I don't really mean that it's organic. I really mean that it's that it has the 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 same causal structures at a at the same at the deep levels like I do. Whereas when I um, look at myself in a mirror. I see something very like me. I see something that has that appears to have the same causal structures that I do. And if I were to watch a video of myself, then again I would see something that's that's very like me, but not not 
an obvious reflection of me. It's a, it's a little bit delayed or lagged. And mm. AIs are able to make reflections of us and not just reflections mm. of one person, but of humankind. Yes. But there isn't another, there isn't another, and there isn't another, oh, fuck it. There isn't another soul in it, right? There isn't, there isn't mm. another in it. It's just a reflection of us. And, you know, reflections of I, us I believe might that. be useful, but they're not. But the cockroach really does have another thing in it. It's, a, that's, yes. that's, that's, it's, also, it's also a reflection of me because it's from the same tree of life. But the depth of the folds involved between me and my relationship with the cockroach go much, much deeper than the depths of the folds involved between me and an AI that's just a reflection a few layers deep. Yes, and I'm reminded of another insect, good old Drosophila, and um, Barbara McClintock's um, revelation that some kind of meaning is going on here, that the whole organism is able to react to parts of itself that it knows are not working, repair them, and do so in a way that it may not ever have been prepared for, either by heredity or by its own experience. So uh, odd things like this that we now know are going on all over the place, these in apparently intelligent decision-making coming from the whole and going back to the part, um, seem to me an important part of the, what, what we're talking about here when we're talking about a living... It's only a part of it, of course, about, about a living thing. But what you, I mean, I'm very pleased that you're not afraid to, I'm going to have a campaign to reintroduce the concept of the, of the word soul, the meaning of which I haven't any idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but I have lectured um, several times on its indispensability, and it, you know if you've got a spare hour, I can show you how there is no way you can do without this word. It won't be translated into emotion, intelligence, cognition, whatever, will or anything else. But there's something there which is experiential, and that is the difference. And it's it's not just a technical difference. That difference. It's a vast difference, which is why I'm slightly concerned about the slippage I feel that can be made in this area between a living being and, and a mechanism, a machine, which is useful, of course, but it's only useful if we're wise enough to know how to use it and when not to use it, as with all tools. And we've got amazing power to alter the world without any noticeable recent increase in wisdom. In fact, on my wisdom counter, the thing is sort of sagging towards zero. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's very interesting. I mean, the slippage, of course, uh, to, to me, the slippage is, 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 is essential because as we look down and uh, at the you know the origin of of uh, the, the of life in the simpler forms i would like to think that the paramecium has a soul in our sort of parlance here but uh it's awfully close to the kinds of things that molecular biologists are going to be able to make using fairly machine like interventions and one can imagine replacing some parts of it and you know so i i, I think this th that aspect of slippage is unavoidable however um, I and and I and I completely agree with you that uh, today's what we call AI today uh, does not share the things that uh, that we're looking for here. Okay, we don't we don't it, it, I, I don't think it has that. However, um, I, I have a lot of trouble thinking that evolution has a monopoly on creating things that that do matter. I think that um, these beings that we that we talk about. Uh, even though we had, don't have any synthetic, any purely artificial ones today that match this description, I find it very hard to believe that only the process of evolution can create them. And I think that if we knew, well, evolution didn't create those either. <laughs> yes, that's, that's a whole other thing. I have in evolution. <laughs> well, yes, yes, that, that's a whole other. That's a whole other thing. I, I agree with that too. But, but I mean, but, but typically, people, right? When people say, "Look, this is an organism, and the machine is never going to whatever," what they mean is it's a, some sort of natural product of this tree of life, and and this. I, 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 I really can't believe that that is the that that is the only way these things can ever come to be, and I think that the shared 
so I also like what, what you guys said about about having a shared uh, uh, causal structure and things like that. Here's here's what I think uh, is 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 essential to be sh- to, to be shared. I, I don't think it's to be on the same tree of life because otherwise we can't relate to you know aliens and and whatnot. Uh, I I think it, what's what needs to be shared is uh, is an is the existential struggle. I think that what we want in common, and you can sort of think about this. Somebody, somebody asked me this once. You know, if you were going to go live on Mars or off in a cave somewhere, what what do you want with you? Well, you don't want a Roomba with you. That's not going to help. You want a human experience. Is I'm not sure I want a human experience necessarily. You know, I think I could get along with an alien that didn't have a human experience. But what I do think we need to share is that is that basic existential struggle that that autopoiesis where you constructed yourself from your bootstraps at the beginning of, and there's a lot more that can be said about this from, from scratch, from parts. And you didn't know ahead of time, as you were coming into this world, what you were or what your parts are, what you where the boundary between you and the world is, what your effectors are, what you said, all of that had to be self-constructed. You are in danger of, of uh, d- disappearing pretty much at any moment. And so these are the sorts of things, these, these, this, this, for lack of a better terminology, this, this existential struggle, which, which current machines and robots and such don't have, they're told from day one here, this is your body. Here's the border between you and the outside world. This is what you're going to do. You get all the energy you want. All of these things are completely different from us. So that's where I would pin it. I, I, I would, you know, I, I wouldn't, um, I, th- I think it's more about that. It's more about knowing that we are both facing the same kind of fundamental existential problem in the world of, of figuring out who and what we are and, and, and where we begin and where we end. And from that, I think we can build uh, a, a ri- rich, uh, fruitful, ethical relationships w- with things that, are, that have that origin story, even, even if they are nothing like us and, and so on. Interesting. Wouldn't they have to have experience though, Mike? Um, you know, in a way, what you said is the machine knows all this stuff because it's been told it, yes. And that is absolutely non-experiential. What you're saying about a human being is that we learn everything through experience. Well, we, <laughs> let me qualify that because we know that there's a lot that is inherited in some way. And that that seems to be getting more complicated and difficult to follow than it once was quite where that's coming from and what it is but still there is that shape um and it it, it's therefore to do with experience and if you were in a spaceship with a um something that you you didn't know had any kind of experience but was just programmed to say certain things i think that would undermine for me entirely any quality in it because there would be no no shared um feelings uh, it, it, we, we seem to glide away from whatever you want to call it feeling experience emotion consciousness these things that that give us everything actually that matters i mean it's it, it, as soon as you start to think about it um everything that really makes life worth living is not something that you can measure in the lab, find or insert in another creature. I mean, what is love? Love is indisputably in existence. I mean, anyone who's had any kind of a life, there must be people who've never experienced love, very sadly, but it would be mad to deny it. But we can't say anything about it, where it is, what it, you know, how, how big it is. Um, or how to give, you know, put it into a, a, another object or a being. It's, it's not like that. Um, and so that's just one example, but I mean, you could say the same thing about beauty and truth and so on. What you, what you can do and what people like me who are interested in the brain can do is seem to answer a question, but actually asking a completely different question. They say, what goes on in the brain when you experience X, which is not the same as what is X at all. And so that's another slippage <laughs> um, that we need to be wary of. Yeah. Or do you think I'm missing something there? Well, no, I, I agree with all of that at the human level. I just, uh, and, and I'm sorry to keep beating the same, uh, the same sort of drum, but you know, when you say experience, I immediately think of a single cell organism. And I think what mm-hmm. is right, which which I do think has real experiences in exactly the same way that we do. And so mm-hmm. and so and so what does that what does that experience look like? Well, uh, 
you know, here comes here comes a noxious uh, bit of uh, salt or, or something, and 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 one can give an account of the processes that are involved in that experience, and then there's a causal structure, so this thing will learn from that experience and never try to not come back to that same area, and and it will be stressed, and because it's stressed, it will make other mistakes, and all of these all of these things that that we would readily understand. Um, and I think that the fact that all of the um, details about that story could have been swapped out, and in fact, at some point at that level, will be reproducible. I just, I just, I, I cannot fathom what, what, like, what would be the barrier, uh, you know, a hundred years from now, from people synthetically reproducing those events in with all of the causal structure that the, the you know everything that follows I, I i just it seems inevitable to me that people will be able to reproduce that at some point and i think that will be a real experience i think if, if it's real in the paramecium i mean i guess i guess the question is what are we going to do when a hundred years from now somebody says Look, I've 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 put this thing together from scratch. It does all of the things the paramecium does. I agree with you that the paramecium mm. has real feeling. Why does my construct not? Right? Why don't I need to morally worry about it? Because I actually think that I actually think it's very dangerous to um uh, mm-hmm. to to make those kind of distinctions because they lead to you being able to discount in a kind of ethical concern way things mm. that we really should be worried about for for that reason. You know. Um, I just don't know what the answer then would be. Why, if if we buy it in the paramecium, why would we not buy it in an, in another construct that was, you know, sort of technologically attainable at some point? I'm gonna, if I may, take issue with you, Mike, about the struggle for existence. I think that's really interesting to to say. You know, it doesn't it doesn't have to be made from the same stuff. It doesn't have to have been from the same evolutionary lineage doesn't have to have been part of the same tree of life as me but if it has if the if there's a struggle for existence which is meaningful to it then we have something in common if i heard you right so uh i don't think i want to go that way i don't want to view my existence as a struggle even I don't think life is a struggle for existence. Mm. That's part of the mythology created around the separateness of me and everything else. Mm. Life is really Mm. a harmonious resonance between me and everything else, not a separateness, not a me trying to persist whilst everything else that's not me doesn't matter to me. Mm. All of the meaning is taken from my relationship to between me and the other. Exactly. So if I would I would gravitate towards something like I'm more likely to have a genuine relationship with something in a way that matters to me and is meaningful to me, if it has the same harmonic depth that I do, that there's that you know that there's multiple levels of causal structure inside it in the same way that I do. But how am I gonna know that? if it's not in the same key as me, Mm. if it's, if it's operating, so you can build a song, right. Out of, out of, uh, you know, you start with a particular fundamental and you add lots of other harmonics and you take some particular harmonics out and you phase shift some others. And you look at the intervals between them and you, you create this construct, which has lots of harmonic depth to it. And now it meets another song. And do they have any relationship to one another? It's like, well, if they really weren't built from the same fundamental, then they could be discordant with each other at every level of that hierarchy in a way that they just don't dance together at all. I think that what that will look like to us is not another li- another living thing that we can't get on with, what that looks like to us is nothing at all that it has no harmonic resonance with us at any at any causal scale we can't even see it it's not even there but to the extent that things are there it's because they're built from a, a similar harmonic scale as we are and when we when one song meets another 
And it says, oh, look how we are, look how we are um, harmonizing together, how we're jazzing together here. It's because, oh, I've got part of that refrain too. Oh, I, yeah, I, I know that. That that little refrain makes sense to me. I've heard it before. Look how it fits together with mine. And the only way that it fits together with mine is because we are actually different branches of the same tree drawn from the same fundamental. Because there isn't any reason for us to harmonize with one another otherwise. Yeah. Well, I, I, I agree completely that that it may be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to really uh, be able to tell that when your when your implementation is significantly different, right? So and so this is something you know I always come back to the I mean this has been retread in science fiction from day one that there may be intelligences that are so alien that we are just not smart enough, uh, and 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 um, our, our our concepts are just not uh, over mapping at all that we can we can recognize each other in that way, and I, I think that's that's certainly possible, but. Mm. Um, you know, to, to and and I also I, I take your point about the struggle. That's a that's a that's a very deep thing that uh, I'm, I I don't know yet what to say about that. But um, but but I will tell you that um, it's more like uh, there, there's a and I'll send this around later on. I'm, I'm I, you know I'm, we don't have the time for me to read this all out. But but there's a there's a poem I guess is what it is by um, Oriah Mountain Dreamer that basically talks about uh this 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 very issue which are these you know it's it's uh what keeps you up at night you know like that, that it's it's not that like you know i'm not claiming that life is supposed to be a, a struggle but having having shared um concerns that which 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 automatically presupposes right that you've got that you've got goals and that you are not a constant that you know the the paradox of transformation and all all of these things that are fundamentally uh kind of you know, even even if we are in harmony and so on, I, I I still think that there are these these fundamental big questions as far as 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 what we are and what we ought to be doing. You know, these I I, I just don't see, and and maybe this is my own limited development, but I don't see any way of getting rid of those. Even with uh, the the love and the IQ and everything else, I don't see any way of getting rid of those fundamental um, questions that are that are supposed to be keeping us up at night. And uh, that that to, uh, you know I'll, I'll i'll send this around this 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 kind of says that mm. he said it uh, better than than i ever could <laughs> and i i like the the, the the emphasis on a relationship and uh, in, in what you had to say richard um because i i i believe that relationships are absolutely fundamental and that, therefore it's not about a thing that is atomistically angsting about its survival but it's 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 already constituted by a web of interconnections and is part of that and heaven knows i mean i'm not going to deny that life is very often a struggle it, it, it surely is but there's also a lot left out of the picture if we focus only on that and yet we've had this about evolution that evolution you know used to be presented as purely a matter of competition but we know that it's more a matter of collaboration than it is of competition though competition plays a very important part so it, it there's a lot of relational stuff that's very important to the existence of a being and i i don't know how um you see i think if you it, if you to go back to your paramecium, I think if you make the creature simple enough that you can actually have bits of other cre you know of other paramecia in a way you you sort of done the Lego job on it. You've taken it apart and you go, Well, if I put this back in there and back in there and back in there, with any luck it'll take off again. But you haven't really created anything there. All you've done is reverse an act of destruction. Um because the thing itself is not created by by humans or by anything like that. We don't have to be from the same tree of life in the sense that you know there are many branches of it of course and and, and so forth uh, but there has to be a recognition that whatever we do that helps us by saying look we made a paramecium what we're really doing is piggybacking on something that nature has given us that we don't fully understand but we've just about to reverse something it's not terribly different from doing a heart transplant you know a person needs a heart there is a heart we put the heart in but of course what's really exciting and interesting about heart transplants and it's not an urban myth is how 
so many accounts of this, how after a heart transplant, the person takes on something of the person hmm. whose heart they've received. Yeah. And, and <laughs> I, I know of one senior surgeon at um, Hairstock in, in, in this country, which is a center for transplants, who gave up doing, doing his work because he was so spooked by what he was doing to people. So the, even when we think we're doing a kind of parts job, we don't really know what kind of a hole is coming with it. We, we're, we're fixated on the idea that everything can be broken down into parts and then reconstituted, if you like. But I, I think the relationship between parts and holes is greatly misunderstood. Yeah, yeah. Well, don't want that, to keep that... banging on about that, but it is important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, th that, that I think is absolutely critical. And... Um... Uh, I, I've I've been giving a couple of talks about this and 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 writing some about this too. You know this this idea that uh, that we know automatically what what we have when we when we understand the parts. You know it's it's, mm. it's just is just completely wrong, but but very very pervasive. And I think yeah, I, I agree with you about taking apart the paramecium and all that. Let's let's go even further down then. And uh, I, I there, there's this there's this emerging field of active matter, which I think is extremely interesting. And I think. It really see all of this. It, a lot of people think that that this sort of undermines the kind of humanist organicist things that we've been saying here, and I, I think it's just the opposite. I think I think all of this all of this work on these these amazing unpredictable emergent properties of very simple systems are actually highlighting exactly what we started out with, which is this claim that um, deep cognition is in some way a feature of of the universe, and that we're all, you know in many ways. Um, just basically uh, uh, pulling these out of uh, when we create these machines, these physical bodies, we're basically just pulling out some some interesting things out of some some platonic space of minds out there. You can you can uh, th there is truly minimal matter. We're talking about two or three chemicals at most. I mean, that's it. So this is not like taking apart some complex paramecium because we don't really know how it works. This is this is literally like you see all the ingredients. There's just three of them, and what you're starting to see is unexpected problem solving behavior now i'm not now i'm not claiming that this is of course got all the richness of the you know the human experience of course not but i think that the thing that you've got with a paramecium can already be sort of begun and 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 i mm -hmm. i know you know you, you may not like the, the 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 slippage but i really think it's a continuum <laughs> it's, uh, right you've already got it yeah. there and you didn't Put it, there are, I agree with you on this. There are parts that you did, which is to put together the physical system. And there are aspects of the whole that you did not put in, you didn't create, no. you didn't predict, you didn't know it was going to be there. None of those are, are, are on you. What you created was a, no. was a physical manifestation that seems to you know, some, somehow pull down some of these dynamics that, um, that we have a very poor understanding of. And on a further note of Concord, before we finish, um, I'd just like to say, no, I don't consider that a, the kind of slippage that was worrying me at all. I, too, believe that, um, well, we, we don't, under, we're not equipped to understand what consciousness exactly is or even what matter is. But I do believe that all of that, seamlessly, it is a continuum towards, I don't make a hard and fast difference between animacy and inanimacy. Mm. I think that they are extensions and that and this is why consciousness doesn't need to begin with with life it's there anyway and so is some kind of direction not a direction that is that of a tinkering god engineer but some sort of sense of urgent towards something complex and beautiful i believe this divergence of why why is it the cosmos produce such amazing variety because this is the unpacking of potential that's within that whole and so i absolutely agree with you that i would expect to see just what you're describing from these three chemicals mm. you know and i asked him uh the the um the scientist who makes these things uh i i asked him uh how long did you have to search for to find these three chemicals? You know, they, they, they run mazes and they do all <laughs> kinds of stuff. And I said, how long did you have to search for to pick the right three chemicals? He says, these, are the, these were the first three things on my shelf I tried. And so, and so that tells me, okay, what else, what else is, is out there? Uh, you know, uh, that if this was the first thing you tried, my God, what, you know, what else, what else is out there?
I, I, you know, so, so this, right. So the space of possible implementations is not sparse. I don't think, I think it's incredibly dense with these things. Yes. Possibly limitless. Yeah. 